So what, what I'm calling this is grand unification of the biological sciences, grubs, right? So I, I've gone around with a whole bunch of uh, titles, but I'm trying to just avoid the BS component. Um, but we'll figure that out later, right? Um, so we've all heard about, about these big toes, these theories of everything, right? So the, the physics have their theory, where's my mouse? That's no, not gonna show up. The physicists have theirs, have their theory of everything. It's all in the material world. It's about physical laws and physical forces. It's completely dead, right? None of that is alive. There's no, uh, it's planets and electrons and that. Biologists have their theory of evolution. That's the other toe. Um, it's based in language and informatics sciences. Uh, this is definitely a lie. It's about biology, right? So you can't have two theories of everything by definition. If it's a theory of everything, it's everything. Uh, if, it's, if it's not everything, then it's not a big toe, right? Uh, I like to think Mother Nature is a fan of reduce, reuse, recycle. So if you get one that works, it's going to cover everything, right? Uh, and we're going to focus a little bit on the mathematics. The idea being that, oh yeah, actually this math, we're going to reduce, reuse, recycle, and we're going to make it fit everything, right? Uh, since we just passed Easter, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and put this, this, this religious interpretation out there. Um, I, I, I think God, uh, you know, he figured out the math early on, and he also decided to just reduce, reuse, recycle. But more importantly, thought, well, look, I'm going to tell people how things work. I'll make it very available to them. I will embed it in every cell of every living being, right? Reality is much more humble today. I'm just going to talk about a couple of conservation laws and some continuity expressions, right? So these big toes. So this is the picture you get for the theory of everything. It's on the time axis, and it's about four fundamental forces, and, and we're trying to unify them. Well, not we, physicists, right? Um, time is the primary axis. And this is what, you know, the whole big show is about in physics, right? This is the grand unification, the big dream. Biology, sequence is the primary axis. And we don't have four, we have three sort of branches on ours, three primary branches, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, right? And, um, but they're all based in genomics. That's the sequence element. And oh my gosh, what you can do with sequence these days is absolutely phenomenal. Right? Uh, so let's just look at, at, at even how much it costs, right? So for the human genome, taking this right off the, the NIH aside, 2021 costs you a thousand bucks to get a whole human genome done. When you go to 23andMe, they don't do your whole human genome, right? They just scan some particular parts and tell you your eyes are green or blue or brown or whatever, right? They look for a couple key things, not the whole kit and caboodle. So you're down a hundred dollar mark, right? Uh, going in the other direction, is the, uh, the the next collider? They want twenty three billion dollars. So so these are sort of two different approaches. But where they do meet, a hundred kilometers long is what they're looking for. You can easily get up to a hundred kilometers. All you need there's two meters of DNA in every cell of your body. So a couple thousand cells. You already got a couple hundred kilometers of DNA. Um, so this sequencing stuff, you know, it's so cheap. What does it really look like? It really looks like this. It looks like smaller than a pack of cigarettes or whatever your favorite little small item is these days. You take a pipette, do some chemistry, mix up your DNA sample in there, squirt it in a little port here, hook it to your computer, it does the sequencing, and bada bing, bada boom, you've got your answer. So uh, one of Jamie Newman's students in biology right now uh, is reporting about some genomic surveillance of uh, SARS-CoV-2 that he did up here. This is, uh, this is my contribution. I plugged it into the laptop or the computer in my lab. So even somebody like me can actually do bioinformatics. It's really that well integrated that they have these sophisticated workflows that even if you have no idea what you're doing, you can do some, uh, some bioinformatics and get yourself in real trouble real fast. But it's all, it's all based on the idea um, of this 1D chromosome coordinate, right? It's the sequence of DNA. So this is what a typical genome browser will look like. So here is a, a human genome assembly number 38. We're looking at chromosome nine, coordinates, right? So there it is, just your coordinates and chromosome space. Uh, 136 million, whatever. We're looking at a 31,000 base pair window. So here's your little scale bar. And then all of this stuff is physical 
property, biophysical, chemical properties, then you associate it with the sequence of DNA. So the chemistry that's happened in that little bitty, um, uh, what, what do they call these little pipettes somewhere down here? The vial? The, the little vial down here, right? Depending on what chemistry you do, right? You chop up your DNA, you do some chemistry on it, then you put it back together, and you say, you know, this happened here, this happened here, this happened here. All depends on what sort of chemical pro uh, reaction protocol you set up, but you can map all kinds of things onto that strand of DNA and begin to associate it. And so the, um, um, the UC Santa Cruz genome browser is like the genome browser, but the little click of buttons here of the information that you can turn on and associate with the genome goes on forever and ever and ever, right? Um, so the way this, the reason this works is that there's well-defined standards. You load your data into your genome browser. You've got these analysis toolkits that are publicly available. What I do when I want to find out if one of those samples has COVID in it is I say download the latest COVID sequences, compare them against what we found in this little vial, see if they match with such confidence, bada bing, bada boom, it's uh, the B12 or whatever variant we could have right now, right? Um, so yeah, it's all fully integrated, highly sophisticated workflows, right? The other worldview is a material worldview, multi-scale genome organization. Uh, I'm not just a member, I'm co-founding chair, uh, hair club for men, multi-scale genome, right? Um, this is the way I like looking at things from a material perspective. So we have uh, genomes are not just sequences, they're really DNA molecules. And so hopefully you all recognize we form DNA, does that watching print structure with the little steps on the ladder. Uh, but it comes in A and Z forms that don't quite look as clean. It rolls up into these things that we call nucleosomes. These are all structures that you can get in atomic resolution. We know where every atom of that molecule is, how they stack together, how they connect. At the end, but that's experiment, so this is my reminder. Go all the way to the other extreme, you can look with an ordinary light microscope at certain times in the cell cycle and see these karyotypes. My mom was a biologist. In the good old days, that's what they would do. They would look at your, your karyotype and tell you, you've got an extra chromosome or a deformed shape chromosome. That's what genetics was. You could just look at it in a microscope, right? But in between here, you get these pictures where you can see what looks like DNA, you can follow it, but you don't know exactly where the path of DNA is. It's all folded up, it's all crunched up. You don't have the resolution to see in atomic detail, but there's clearly some patterns, there's clearly some structures, right? So in between are all the theories that try to put this together and span this broad gap. Of course, you know, the, the, we're always continu continuously making inroads into higher and higher scales and resolutions, pushing up bigger and bigger this way, going down lower, you know, higher, uh, finer resolution this way. But in between, uh, what they've had pushed out for a long time in your standard textbook is that the DNA folds up in these things called nucleosomes. And the nucleosome hypothesis was just put out in 1974, the first structure in 1997. I'm sure there's people here that weren't even born when those things were happening, right? 1997, I was at a uh, a molecular biology uh, of a meeting of nuclear organization of the cell in New Mexico. Um, a woman who I uh, had, had solved this structure, Carolyn Luger was there. I was like, gotta meet her, gotta meet her, because I gotta get that structure. They also announced that was when Dolly uh, got the first clone. Well, I was like, eh, you know, it's, it's not important. We're here to talk about structure, organization in the nucleus of the cell. We don't care about cloning. It, it, I, I, I take a aside on that because we often, as scientists, get in our own little bubble of, you know, this is what's important to me, but this talk, I'm going to be jumping way outside of the bubble of what's important to me and, and really comfort zone. But that's uh, good every once in a while. Anyways, so we have um, tried to fill in with theory between these regions of experiment. So back over my little ladder here, you've got DNA, it folds up into these little things. These things compact together. And they used to call it a 30 nanometer fiber, but uh, you say that in public these days, and people look at you funny, it's a banned word, that uh, it doesn't really form such a nice pretty structure. But whatever this is, whether it exists or not, forms these loop structure, and then that loops, and then you get what you see in a microscope, right? 
The other thing they can do is, is indirect measures is you can go with your sequencing and you can find out where every piece of the DNA is touching itself. And you ligate it together, and this is what the uh, general class of, of chromatin capture experiments. And you find out where things are close to each other, you sequence it, you put it back together, and you say, I'm going to draw a structure where these two parts touch, these two parts touch, these two parts touch, these two parts touch. And they go just off of a contact ma matrix for the whole genome, and they tell you this is the spaghetti structure that it looks like. But this is such low resolution, right? This is a giant sausage tube stuffed with, you know, who knows what. But there is a little thread of DNA that runs in through it somewhere. It's not completely ground meat. It's a thread. It's more like stuffing in spaghetti, right? So these physical models, they're all based in, uh, in classical mechanics, right? And uh, they, we have our own set of standards, our 3D coordinates, molecular visualization, well-established force fields for the atomic stuff. When you start getting up to higher resolution and other things, it's people are arguing about what's the best force field and what's important and what's not. I'm going to sidestep all those issues today and just say force is uh, at some point. Um, and, and so that's an important note. That if I get too caught up in the force fields, then I'm going to miss some important stuff. But they have compute engines and scientific gateways, and you can burn up millions and billions of hours uh, doing this. And this is what I typically do in the lab with students and my, my buddies, right? But what do we really know, right? I go to a meeting and I ask, well, you know, so what determines the length of DNA in a particular chromosome? And they look at me like, Tom, you know, don't ask stupid questions, right? There is no real answer to that. You might come up with some hand-waving arguments that like, well, it can only be so long because, no, but there's no real reason. Why, why are there 23 pairs of chromosomes in human and, and you know, a different count than something else? Uh, I don't know, right? Um, we find that in, in uh, some species, they have circular DNA. The DNA wraps back around on itself. In others, it's linear. And there's all kinds of reasons, but no fundamental sort of law about why this is so. But there are some consequences from being linear versus circular DNA. You would think chromosome count would have, relate to something. Um, yeah, and, and why, why a four-letter code? Why, why A, C's, G's, and T's for DNA? The typical answer would be that, oh, well, because codons are of length three and four to the third is 64, that's enough to describe your 20 amino acids. So now that whole biology thing work of building proteins works, right? Um, but if I look at the fundamental building block, not just DNA, but the first level of folding of DNA, that uh, what we say that, that, that really in the human cell, there is two meters of DNA in these guys. If you pull it straight, it would be two meters of DNA. But this is micrometers, right? So it's got to be crunched up, folded up somehow. And it needs to be organized, because it can't just get knotted. Although there are proteins that know how to untie knots, called topo, topo isomerases. And they do exactly what you would do if you get in really bad trouble. You cut the string, you untie it, and you glue it back together. That's exactly what these topo isomerases gyrases do. It's, it really happens. I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up, right? It's, uh, it's very clever, very sophisticated, right? Well, no, it's just a protein. All right. But between here and here is really, it's grayed out because we don't know, right? But going back to my sequence space idea, we do know that there's 147 base pair in here. So if we look at this as like, you know, this is our elemental building block. It's like the periodic table. We want to know what's going on there. If you take those four letter codes, A's, T's, G's, and C's, and you write down all the possible sequences you can, you're going to be at it for a while, right? You're at 10 to the 88 possible sequences right here for one of those. To get a feeling for how big that number is, 10 to the 80th is the, the, the estimate for the number of known particles in the universe. So it's big. If that doesn't impress you, here's the population of the world, 10 billion people. You have, each one has 10 trillion cells, right? And they have 10 billion base pair, right? Even the total number of base pairs of everybody that currently exists on Earth is a lot smaller than that. This is 10 to the what, 20, 30? We're like, you know, leagues away. I have enough information and complexity in one of these nucleosomes to label every single base pair of every single person in the world that's currently alive. That's way overkill from Mother Nature's point of view. 
I mean, uh, you, you can ask on that tree of life, you know, why is there a little more diversity here, right? Where there's more that I have in common with, with, with yeast than, than, than is warranted probably, right? In fact, you look at, at the little structures you have for these things for yeast and for humans, and they're, they're almost identical, right? Uh, three differences between frog, mouse, frog, mouse, and human, right? That, that we, we, we made the models. There's only a couple little spots when you start looking at the sequence of these things for the protein that folds it up. And it's like, but these are wildly different critters, right? Okay. So the, the idea is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, DNA is the common thread through all of these critters, through all of these structures. And what it does is it provides an ordering of everything in space. This, if I park it on the DNA, is now uh, I can tell you in sequential order, does it come before or after that one, before or after that one, before or after that one. There is an ordering to everything related to the genome because the DNA connects them. You don't get that with the sun, the moon, the stars, and the sky. You've got a sun here, it's not connected to any of the other planets. There's no way you can enumerate one, two, three, four in any sort of sequence. Everything associated with the genome is enumerated in a specific order. This is why bioinformatics works. It's because information requires it. You can't just scramble up the letters of a book and say, oh, there's the book. They have to be presented in a certain order, right? So this is what we have, right? We have a physics worldview, we have an informatics worldview, we have a sequence that runs through both, right? So uh, the ECODE project, I love this slide they put together. Um, it really gets at what we want, right? We can associate all kinds of biophysical characterization of a sequence through all these advanced sequencing techniques um, and map it back to a 3D structure, right? But we don't really know from this perspective what the 3D structure is. These are two different worlds. When you go to meetings, there's the informatics crowd, there's the physics crowd. I don't do this, I don't do that, right? What's this gonna tell me? I have everything I need. I only need to know that this is the gene that makes me smarter. I can care less about the shape up here. I'm gonna put this in my CRISPR kit and we're gonna rule the world. That's uh, you know very application driven, not looking at it from a fundamental science point of view. But we can unify these two things. We can put the physics and the informatics back together. If we go back and look at DNA, and here I provide it what I'll, I'll call a continuous model of the DNA. And the way we do this, is we put uh, a director frame, right, at, at certain locations here. And there's, there's ways to line it up. You line it up with the base pair. I told you that chemically, the DNA, the bases are flat. So this is very well defined. It's the orientation of the bases, and then that just results. So there's, there's standard methods for doing this. But here's the location of one of these base pairs, one of the steps on the watson Craig ladder. Here's another one. This is some base pair later. So we look at those and we say, Okay, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about, here's the, the position of one, its location in space, and its orientation, which I'll call D for director frames. Here's another one. Again, someplace down the road, it's got an, uh, a position and orientation. But what I wanna do is switch my perspective to an internal coordinate frame where I ask now from the sequence space perspective, how do I get from here to here? Not from the corner of the room to there and there, but from one of these to the next. Right? And so we'll call this the vector that goes from here to here, gamma. But we're going to write it in terms of this vector, which is the instantaneous axis of rotation. So if you know your physics or you know your geometry, that when you have a three-dimensional rotation in space, there's an axis associated with it. And you draw a vector and you rotate it around that. So this is going to be key. And it is actually omega, the direction of that rotation is what we're going to use. So now we've got a way to uh, at least describe these formally. Let's look at mathematically where they come from. Well, we take the derivative of, of the, the, the space curve R, or just the tangent. But then I don't want the tangent, I want to orient it with respect to my director frame. So I put a transformation matrix in front of it. Technical detail at this point, maybe. This, for the people who uh, who have taken the mechanics class, I call that the Dormeau vector. Whenever you have a rotation, this is how you describe it. It's that omega vector 
over here. This is the instantaneous axis of rotation. This is how you step from one to the other, right? These are derivatives. Well, how do you undo a derivative? You integrate. So if I start here, I would just integrate, and I would get the difference between two spots there. If I integrate this, I get the difference between two director frames. Typically, you would start at the origin, not S. But if I want to know, did it loop around onto itself? Make that zero. Do I make it come back to exactly the same frame? Make this zero. And this would be a way where you would describe loops. Whenever this is zero, you've identified a loop. So what we have, this idea of a genome transform, is that we can go from what I'll call real space to sequence space. It's a transform that gets you from here to here. Or I can go from sequence space to real space. I'm not the first one to think of it or to propose it. There's lots of, there's a couple of well-known programs in the biological community for doing this. 3DNA and curves are two of them. But what we've done with them, they're, they're generally used at the base pair level to make base pair models. But there's nothing to stop you from putting these director frames as far apart as you want and make a coarse grain or even a super coarse grain model. Or you can go the other direction and you can make it a continuous model where you can do real mathematical analysis. Uh, and then what you would want to do is use some sort of numerical differentiation and integration scheme to do these things, really do continuous math. Um, All right. So we call this the genome transform. Um, it's, it's again, it's a new spin on these things that exist where we're using them at all kinds of different scales. What we want to do um, is use these as, as a sort of informatics console for navigating the physical world. So I, I show a cockpit, a dashboard of a cockpit, because this is really exactly what's happening, or what we want. What we want to do is take all this informatics, right? It might tell you wind speed, flaps, rudders, gas, whatever. That doesn't directly tell you where you are in the 3D world. Here's the 3D world, right? But you want to integrate these. A proper, well-trained pilot can navigate through that just by instruments, or they can turn off all the instruments and look at that and tell you if everything's correct, right? So this is the world view. It's an internal coordinate from the cockpit where we want to drive through the DNA. Just as a reminder, there's, of course, the other world view. The guys in the control tower see the 3D path of the plane, right? We want to be internal, and we want to switch back and forth between these. In fact, I've actually been in touch with some people that do exactly this sort of thing. It's the exact same math that I'm playing with, right? So that's kind of the cool thing. So for our purposes, what we need to do is transform between real space and sequence space. What I'm going to apply on top of it is these masks. Right? A mask would be, well, maybe I want the DNA to do a loopy loop here. Or maybe, uh, if I'm really just looking at these locations, I never told you what sequence of DNA to put there. So I need some additional information, not just the space curve, right? But I need to know, you know, how much fuel we had at that location. What was the wind speed at that location? Whatever. We need additional information. But again, this is all just a function of sequence. And we can write it all out as yet another track in the genome browser type thing. So we keep adding dimension after dimension after dimension, and we can transform back and forth. Or we can go into three-dimensional space and, and color our DNA however we like and put important information on it, right? Make the plane light up red when it goes through the storm, right? That's something you would want to do on one of your little radars to say, these two are about to hit each other. Right? or whatever. You want to take the 3D model and also map informatics onto it. That's useful. So we call that the mask, right? So here's a, a quick summary for, uh, for hopefully we have people in here that understand what a Fourier transform is, right? Uh, this is sort of a general science -y thing. I call it a genome transform very specifically, choosing words that are reminiscent of the Fourier transform Right? You have a reciprocal space and a, and a real space in the Fourier transform. We have a sequence and a real space. You can do filtering uh, with wave numbers in your Fourier transform. We can do multi-scaling just by averaging, doing partial integrations. You can associate whatever you want with these rigid bodies. You can put big blobs of protein, or you can put a base pair, an atom, whatever you want. We have discrete and continuous implementations. So the whole host of mathematical and numeric analysis is available. Right? These algorithms are ridiculously fast, right? 
So you can do anywhere from one to 100,000 plus base pair at atomic resolution. Each base pair of DNA is about 60 atoms. So 60 times 100,000 is whatever math it is, right? You can make models like that, throw them up on the screen. The computers are fast enough. I'll show you some pictures in a minute, right? But it's scalable, right? So I can take step sizes in this discrete world of one base pair, 10 base pair. I can treat whole segments of it as, as, a, as a rigid body. Go 500 base pair, take a right, and then you know go another 500 base pair. Those type of directions work, right? We're taking an internal coordinate. As long as you're going straight here, right? Then boom, over here, okay? But these approaches are mathematically different. And, and I will say that, that these two mathematical models are different and they're different from this. And that does cause a little bit of confusion in, um, uh, in the world that I work in when they start applying these. And they say, well, the angle's 3.9 degrees. And it's like, no, it's 3.7. And I'm like, well, it depends which algorithm you use. And, and nobody's really done a very detailed analysis of exactly why that is. Um, but we can. I won't bore you with the details today. Um, what is cool is that this ODE, the ordinary differential equation version, is geometrically exact. And that's, I think, very important. These are not geometrically exact, but they are what they call strand invariant. For the biologist, DNA is double strand, uh, leading strand, and the anti parallel other strand, complementary strand, right? What you want is if you're going to have the same structure, keep them both right handed, mm -hmm. then there has to be a certain symmetry. And uh, these methods are designed to preserve that symmetry. All right, so this is what it looks like when you start playing this game. So I can take any sequence of DNA, and I chose this sequence of DNA because it gives you, if there are four bases, you can have four types of steps, AA, AC, AG, AT, right? And then I can do CA. So this covers all four of them. There's 16 of these steps because it's a four by four matrix, 10 of which are unique. That's why I chose this. This is what a simple little snake model looks like. This is what it looks like. And again, you can see that these are really planar structures. So it's very intuitive. It's, it's very well defined to put those axes in it and you know where they are and you can really make high resolution models this way. Okay, so that's only 16 base pair. What if you want to do 230,000 uh, base pair? So here is uh, chromosome one from the, uh, the yeast genome. Uh, you see it, you want to read it, that little gray matter? That's actually the sequence in FASTA format, all 230,000 characters. And you can fold it up with this program in just a couple of seconds. These little loopy loops are those little nucleosome structures. So I just crammed it full of nucleosome structures. And so instead of it being 230,000 times a third net times a third, this would be 240 kilobase, call it a thousand. Each one is a third of a nanometer. So here we have 80,000 nanometers long. Uh, is how long it would be, which is 80 micrometers, is that right? Way bigger if you stretched it straight than the yeast nucleus, but because it's folded, it fits. And I didn't do anything magical. This is just how it pops in. All the little bends and curves in here come from the fact that some of these steps of DNA like to bend, some of them are straight, some of them bend. And so this compactedness comes from the sequence of DNA. If I just had a very bland, homogeneous model, this would still just be a straight long fiber. Okay. All right. So that's fine. That's good. I needed something better than just my simple Fortran implementation that I did a long time ago. And so I started thinking like a computer scientist. And I said, what we need is a model view controller design. And it'll all work. So this is how they work, right? So the model is I've been talking about my genome transform. Mathematically, this is the data that we have to manage. Then what I put is some sort of controller on it that manages the differentiation, integration, the, 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 but then everything else is just viewing that data. If I want to see a nice 3D picture, I look at this data. If I want to see a genome browser view, I look at this data. If I want to do some <coughs> other plots, then I need to somehow run another uh, routine which manipulates this data to form whatever I want, right? 
So all of that is done with just plug-in viewers. These genome browsers, there's a bajillion of them. So we can pick whichever we want, as long as we use the recognized format, I just point it at that data. There's many different molecular viewers, I just point it at that data, and we can make uh, a tool that we call a genome dashboard, right? So here it is. Here's the BioDalliance genome dashboard with its chromosome and its coordinates. And here now, I plotted those internal coordinates are roll, tilt, twist. This is structure data next to informatics data that tells you about the sequence and everything else. So I combined structure and informatics here in a very direct way, right? And we can make our, our 3D models, and so let's look at that. But we can also, because I can put any kind of views that I want, I can do little integrations, right? I said you can do partial integrations. Well, I can make maps based on this, and we'll call this a woodcock plot. Um, Ramachandran was the guy, different Ramachandran, but he did protein plots, and he said, look, there's only two angles you need to describe a, uh, 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 a protein. So we're trying to make uh, what, what Woodcock said, the chromatin, we can do it. <coughs> we can make different representations, and these mean a lot to people, right? So not only this 3D view, but we can also give 2D views, 1D views, genome browsers, right? This is just the nucleus home, nucleus home contact. You see these are too close? There they are, right? They show up in red, they show up there as close contact. Everyone else is just equally scattered, nice uniform fiber. Keep that in mind. Okay, so I mentioned before that, um, that you have these ideas of circular DNA. Uh, in, some, in some species. And so it turns out, if you take DNA or any, um, any, any, any closed curves, how do I say this? <clears throat> any, any ribbon that has these backbone structures and you link it together, you end up with, um, <clears throat> with the conserved quantity that, that we have. So we have a, um, what they call the linking number, is the number of times that this one crosses in front of that. So in front, behind, in front, behind, in front, behind, in front, is coupled with the twist that you have and whether or not the ride, whether this is planar or not. So you can get rid of some of the twist or the, or the linking number by folding it, and that's kind of equivalent to untwisting. So if you've ever worked with uh, a lot of fishing line or an extension cord while you're putting out your Christmas lights, you know that uh, that these things are all coupled and then when it starts to get twisted, right? This is a reminder to show you the movie. From my point of view, this is kind of cool. Because we can now do simulations that are big enough that have circular DNA, but it's really fun because we put loop-de-loops in it. And so what we can see is here's a structure of one of these nucleosomes which has a bunch of DNA wrapped around it. It goes over, wraps around another one of these. And what we're seeing is a conversion of ride into twist in the simulation. So what happens is the orientation of this changes and you can see that the overall, um, no, this is the other number, different perspective. You can see that they're rotating relative to each other. And the only way for that to happen is for the DNA to twist and untwist in various locations. And so we can follow this topologically, mathematically, and write out exactly what's happening. So this is really cool. If you don't close the DNA, then all bets are off because one end can just spiral however it wants. And so to be able to make structures and simulate them, the computers are finally caught up with, uh, with the fun we really want to have, right? So, um, all right, so let's go back. It also brings up a thing called the leaking number paradox with nucleosomes, but we'll avoid that for now. So we can talk uh, DNA topology, we can talk structure, we can talk sequence. The, 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 the mathematical analysis and the way we can look at this becomes very rich. But that's all been going, uh, I've been taking sequences and making structures, is what I've been showing you now. Give me a sequence of DNA, I'll fold it up in a 3D model, and we can play with it. Let's go the other direction, because this is reversible, right? 
give me a 3D model. And so here's one that is a discotheque model, discrete charge opt uh, optimized model um, that I got from a colleague at NYU. Um, she's very famous for this particular model. So here are her little balls of nucleosomes and the DNA connecting it. But what we can do is we just reduce those back into a ball and straighten out the DNA. And then we say, well, we know there's the threading in it. So now we have this coarse grain model where we have DNA, 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 a big curve, DNA, 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 a big curve, DNA, DNA. And so I didn't restrict myself to being straight. I gave myself the details of the pathway here so that I could preserve the little curves that she had. So this was something actually we see along this part of this thesis. And so what we can do is we can go, instead of going this way to build the model, we can start up here and drag this model into our genome browser and it's going to automatically convert this 3D structure to all those derivatives um, and calculate the tilt, twist, rise, all the green structures. So it'll put the structures in here. It will also map out where these little nucleosomes are and write that out as maps. I'll get to that in a second. It'll make a, a Ramachandran type plot or a Woodcock plot. We see that this structure is much more diverse than what I showed you before. It's not one of those clean, little spirally 30 nanometer fibers. It has some 30 nanometer fiber character, but there's a lot that's not. We can map out and see what's in close contact through beads like this, but we can also see that this region is separated from whatever some other region is. So there are some two distinct domains in this that you see off of these contact maps. So people that really know these can get a wealth of information out of this model. But this is all contained. We have a 3D view, a, uh, an angle view, a contact map, and now we have a sequence view where we can map it back. Well, this was the HOC6 gene, she told me. And we can go back and say, you know, right here was supposed to be this guy. And we can go and rapidly identify it. It took her postdoc over a year to collect the information to make this model, she said. Here, it's a drag and drop problem. You drag all the data. There, you want your nucleosomes here? We'll put them there. You want them there? We'll put them there, right? That's was quit screwing around with a bunch of Excel spreadsheets. Just load up the experimental data, click, and you got the model. Run it to your simulation, drag it back, and see if you got something that's consistent, right? But <coughs> I will say that um, experiment is where they said the nucleosome should be. That postdoc said the model, sh the nucleosome should be here. I'm not sure. I, I, I got the same source that the postdoc did for where the nucleosomes will be, and I'll leave it at that, right? Um, but the other thing you can do, if you particularly like this structure, right, I can cut it out in 3D and try to move it and reconnect it, and that might be a little hard. I have to get the right orientation and all that. But in this space, if this is how I describe its structure, I can cut this out move it over here and plug it in, and I've just taken that little folded module and put it wherever I want, and I'm guaranteed that the continuity is there. This becomes just like a video editor. I had Z Long, um, the first author there, Lee, uh, make a video of some of this, and I was watching him use the video editor. It was like, oh my god, videos are just sequence data. It's a time evolution, cut and paste, click and click, weave it together, <coughs> and have a movie, right? All right, so a couple of asides. Um, Jane Richardson uh, totally changed the field of uh, protein structural biology just by drawing some pretty pictures. When you get an x-ray structure, all you see is a bunch of atoms. You still have to connect them, right? It's very hard to figure out, is there any organization to that, right? You look at a bunch of, I mean, when you really get it, you just see, well, there's a bunch of points in space. Right, you still have to layer on the connectivity. Oh, and here I can see a little bit of connection and all that, right? Oh my gosh. But if you really know what you're doing, you can now say, oh, if I look at this correctly, there's a helix there. There's a sheet there. These things, right, and this is colored by the structure. If you know what you're looking for, you can look at this and spot it, but no way in the world you'll spot it if you're not trained, unless you have one of these. And so the way you represent these molecular structures, is incredibly important to how we think about it. The problem with DNA is we're still stuck with, it's a double helix, it's steps on a ladder. Yeah. What are the green arrows for? These? Yeah. 
Those are those are the sheet-like structures. So here, the backbone is just going up and oh, down. Oh, there's a direction. In so so the backbone is going this yeah. way, and, and it, it tells you that the backbone of the protein really is flat, just wobbling up and down. And the hydrogen bonding, I believe, sticks that way. And they can go parallel or anti-parallel. So it tells you all kinds of information about locally what's happening. Here, these are helices. Now, the backbone is curved around, and the hydrogen yeah. bond is, is going up and down this way as it spins around. So you get a lot when you start to study these, figuring out what's going on, right? So which man did her invention get named after? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. But wait, this is even even better than ribbon diagrams. We have dancing man on fusion, right? So, so who would have thought that if you write down this string, this is a smile string, that's just a sequence of characters, right? These are atomic symbol characters. These mean something, and I don't really even know the language yet. But uh, there's grouping. These are unique. When you know the rules, you can transform this into a 2D model. Now you see nanofusion from lily fusion, right? The, um, the uh, Gulliver's Travels. These are little nano things. I can convert that into a 3D structure, and you see the little happy smiley kid. A guy, um, what's his name again, Ramu? Um, Tor, James Tor, is the one who made these very popular. He made a whole library of these little things. But this now, it's not just fun and game. I cannot even pronounce the proper IUPAC name for this. I would hate to have to memorize it, but if I write this file string, this gets us into the world of informatics. You can Google that. Well, if you just Google it, you get all kind of weird things. But if you go to PubChem, it knows that it's a file string and you know how to look it up. This is a unique smile string. Character one, two, three, four is this card, let's say. We have an indexing in the three-dimensional space. We can do all kind of crazy stuff. This is not just specific to my chromatin world. This is what you get when you have a sequential order, right? A sequence and a rule for converting it into 3D space. You have a way of mapping back between four of these and keeping track of all your informatics. Okay, but nobody said you have to make chromatin or biology or whatever you want out of here, right? In biology, there's a very you know important sequence structure fu function paradigm, right? But who says it has to have a biologic function? These DNA fountain people said, no, 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 no. Let's encode Wikipedia as a sequence of DNA. If I can do it as ones and zeros, why not A's, G's, C's, and T's? In fact, it's more compact. And in terms of durability. DNA, we've got samples of DNA from mammoths and whatnot. We don't have any hard drives that are millions of years old, right? So we don't know the longevity of anything stored digitally. We know that DNA stands the test of time. So we would have a sequence, a structure. This is actually the structure. And for people who know, anybody recognize this? It's my favorite sequence. The mouse memory tumor virus promoter sequence, 1,479 base pair. There's a couple of ERVs, and anyway. But you can interpret it as a book, you can interpret it as a movie, you can interpret it as whatever you want. And that's what the DNA fountain people did. It's just like the code ones and zeros on your computer. I pull out my hard drive, I don't know what the ones and zeros are. But here it is, you're looking at it. So on that model view controller paradigm, we can attach whatever we want with the viewer and that's the function component. It's not a 3D gizmo. It's a movie. It's a book. It's a whatever. So our model view controller paradigm for a dashboard <coughs> we can take the genome browser view. We can take this view, and this would be your physical device that's storing the information, a piece of DNA, right? And um, oh, and here's a little reminder: the the DNA fountain people said, right? Well, there's the information, and there's an informatics problem, and that's it. But when we focus in on that it also exists as a three-dimensional structure, we can do fun things just like making it closed DNA. Now what you have is an error detection bit that is completely independent of the sequence. The 3D structure codes and can tell you if it's closed DNA, it's a good sequence. If it's busted, uh-oh, something's wrong. Better check your model and see if it's there. So 
by marrying together sequence and structure, we get extra information that's over and above what's coded in the sequence. Any biologist will tell you, of course, that's true, that structure matters. But if you're just thinking like sequence is all there is, you'll stop there. So there's much more to be explored in terms of, of this. All right, so we got a few more minutes. That was just the space domain. There's a whole other part of the talk where I go into the time domain. So backing up, this is where I said I got started. All of these are S's. I took derivatives in space along the length of the DNA. I integrated along S. I used these programs, watch carefully. I'm gonna take all of the S's, which are positioned along DNA, and swap them out for T's. Instead of having the position in the space, these all become velocities. For anybody who's a navigator, these are your navigational inertial coordinates, search, sway, heave, which most of your pilots understand, never ever pay attention to. I guess you have to be on the high seas before you see sway and heave, right? Roll, pitch, and yaw is what every pilot knows about flying, right? Exact same, you repeat the whole talk, change everything I said about sequence to time, and you've got something completely different. What we can do now that we have time and space, we can build up a very quick rod model. So if I take, here's a little segment of my DNA, I look at the forces coming in on one side, the forces coming out. Newton said, balance your forces. You balance them, and let's just look at this little segment. Oh, that's a derivative, right? Balance of forces divided by this, so the force per unit length is a derivative. And Newton said that's supposed to be the change in your linear momentum. So we have the change in force along a rod is equal to the time evolution of the rod. That. Same sort of idea can be applied to the torque, but what happens with torque, or the moments, is that if you have a force acting over this length, you get an extra moment. So there's an extra R cross F term that appears here, right? All right, but that's if you're doing it from the laboratory's point of view. If I do it internally, every time I take a derivative, I have to end up throwing in this Darbo vector. This is getting a little more technical than I really want to. But at the end of the day, this is just uh, a force balance and linear momentum, um, uh, angular momentum, and, and the moments. These are continuity relations that tell you that the shape of the rod in space and time needs to be smooth. Gamma was the first derivative of the position, so gamma t is the second derivative. So this is a mixed partial, a mixed partial. They should be equal, but because I'm in an internal coordinate, I pick these up. So this was written down by these guys, SMK, 1998. This is where I went to go study my postdoc, I thought, uh, 1980. I, I, I went uh, and I said, there, there were some guys at Berkeley using this to model DNA. And they were only looking at that side of it, right? But this is just like wicked cool sort of problems. We can take and take these, these forces, well, so here's the rest of it. This is the linear momentum. If that's a velocity, that's a density, that's a linear momentum. If this is the position, the difference in the positions um, times some uh, matrix is gonna give you a force. So the reason we use capital P's and little p's should be obvious, capital and little. It's showing you the symmetry. Our moments we're writing out as the differences in bending, right? And so you see the capital M's and the little m's. These got gammas, right? And so these got gammas. So we've tried to highlight the symmetry, time, space, time, space, gamma, omega, gamma, omega. Um, yeah, I think, okay. But this itself is not symmetric. If we put this term in, now this is where we have symmetry. Two terms, and you don't have to know anything about that. This is, this is, this is one of those things where, where you just have to tell you the rules of the game and you'll spot it. One, two terms, one, two terms. This is with a T, this is with an S. Everywhere you see a T, you see an S, right? There's an X, there's an X, there's an X, there's an X, plus another X x and x, and that game about the, 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 the lower and upper case. So what you can see is that whatever's written on the left-hand side, not only looks a hell of a lot like what's written on the right-hand side, it's exactly the same mathematical form. That's what we mean by symmetry from a mathematical point of view. It's identical. If I can solve 
that side, then I can solve this side, right? Is one way to look at it. Uh, I'll skip over that. That's just the scaling constants. It's just a reminder for me to say it's scalable that I can make this apply to DNA or anything at any scale I want, right? I'll, in the interest of time, skip over this. So what happens when you take one side and set it equal to zero? You get a hierarchy of solutions. And this is why I went to work with, with Sheena Hurst, right? One set of solutions is just constant functions. That has a constant twist. One is trigonometric functions. When you put trigonometric functions into this, you get perfect helices. The next level of functions are elliptic. So this is what you know when you bend any sort of piece of metal. It's not circular in cross-section. It gets loopy loop. It's a, it's a clear sign of elasticity. I proposed at the time that these have elliptic cross-sections and that that's, you can make these fibers. And so one of the things I did with them is parameterize this to match that. But now you can start the whole process over again and say, no, this is my fiber, not that. And you can see that this should be trigonometric loop-de-loops, and then you would have elliptic loop-de-loops. And the beautiful thing about this is the time scales depend on the constants, which are related to the mass. This has intrinsically more mass per unit length than that. So this is a slower mode of motion than that. So this folding of DNA not only changes its shape, it changes its dynamic character. So now you have a way to go from atomic scale time, distance, and motion to something that's an order of magnitude or whatever is higher to yet an even different order of magnitude. And this is what you need inside your cells is to be able to switch from you know, something on the pico femtosecond scale to something on the seconds, minutes, hour scales that, that are appropriate uh, for cellular life. For the physicist, you may recognize the solution as a spinning top. You've got a constant spin. You've got a wobbly, wobbly, you, you've got a, um, uh, a precession, or you've got the wobbly, wobbly. Constant trigonometric elliptic. It's the exact same solution. So the fun part comes when you mix and match them, right? Here I have the space curve, and here I have the time curve. If you want the roller coaster to stay on the track, the space curve, the time evolution, better meet the space curve. If the plumber is going to get the snake down the drain, this time evolution of that plumber snake has to match the shape of the drain. If the cardiologist is going to go to your heart, that little snake better follow your veins or you go into the emergency room fast. So there's other geometrically exact rod models that have been used in the math. They apply it to these curling plants. Transoceanic cables in the good old days was a problem. This is what they look like now. They've applied this exact same model to, to syrup and candy. Oh my gosh, the people that made the movie here know something about geometrically exact rods and the dynamic like you wouldn't believe. There's little bitty wires sticking out of the back of here that are geometrically exact rods. They're satellite tethers. But for the purposes of physics, I'm really just looking at the propagation of a force and a moment through space. There was nothing in my equations until I said linear constitutive relations that said anything at all about the nature of the force, right? I just said, we got a force and we've got moments. That's just simple conservation laws is what we got going on, right? So I can interpret these waves as anything I want. I can make them as long as I want. I can make them as short as I want. There was nothing I ever said about the length of the rod. I never said anything about it had to be uniform or this. So I can track, as long as you tell me you want it to go along this curve, I can tell you how the evolution of those forces and moments will be on a geometrically exact curve. If we just start counting up the dimensions of these, I gave you 12 equations bundled as four and three vectors. 12 items bundled as four sets of three, right? I told you that space and time were related through some sort of scale factor, and we could come up with solutions, right? But depending on how I did the coupling, I could come up with all kinds of different numbers and other things. The other thing we played with was this four-letter alphabet, we had 16 
dinucleotide steps, sets of force constants that tell you the bending, right? This led us to 10 unique parameters. These numbers I point out because at a deep level, it's a counting game that I'm playing, right? That this is getting back to, I don't know what strings look like, but just from a pure dimensional analysis point of view, counting, they look a lot like geometrically exact rods. And again, I'll point out that the conservation law and continuity relations were the only thing that went into this. And so, while I know nothing about this really, um, I've read the popular literature and I think, oh my gosh, you know, there's specific couplings that I play with, there's specific couplings. That these things give up and turn from force into this into that. That's exactly what we have going on. So either, um, whether or not it has anything to do with strings, at some level is completely unimportant. What I can do is take the way they think about strings and apply it now to biology. They have reaction diagrams that tell you how these things interchange. If I go back and map it into my world of biology, I can generate reaction diagrams for genetic processes. That's the way I'm looking at this, is there's other people playing these games with a similar set of physics problems and equations and boundary conditions quite literally. I'm gonna take that and use it to inform the way we do our biology. So I'll leave the acknowledgments up uh, for here. Um, some grad students, postdocs had worked with me uh, when I was at Tulane. Um, Rand is actually presenting some of the work right now at an LDRN meeting. Um, Song Ming, I didn't mention it in this, um, but he's got what they call a magic stick. You know the Rubik's Cube, but the straight, straight little magic stick, the little game that you fold up. So he's looked at that as a folding problem. As you take uh, the, these long little kids games, but he has an integer number of rotations that you can do. And all of his translations are the same. But anyway, he wants to do folding of magic snakes. It gets you into the world of robotics very quickly because they have little snake-like robot arms, right? But these are some of the other folks that have helped uh, along the way and cobbled together pieces of money from whoever and wherever I can. 